When Arthur Rothstein arrived in Washington to join the Farm Security Administration in 1935, they called him the kid from the Bronx. He was just 20. Raised in the Bronx, he was born in Manhattan. New York City, with its bustle of people, the stimulation of everything coming at you at once was madness, but he must have loved it. He called himself a provincial New Yorker, and at 20, he knew nothing of America beyond the Hudson. All that would change. If he had thought poverty was only an urban problem, he would see how dead wrong he was once he got on the road with a camera free from the city's distractions. In 1935, the country was on the ropes, and he was supposed to photograph it. In high school, he loved photography. At Columbia University, he founded the camera club and put together some agricultural photographs for his professors, Roy Stryker and his boss, Rexford Tugwell. Rothstein discovered his two professors saw photography as functional, a way of creating social and economic change. But Arthur wanted to be a doctor, not a photographer. The Depression made getting up all that money for tuition and books out of the question. So there he was, like many his age, with a college degree and no job. He had little choice but to say yes when Stryker asked him to come with him to Washington to make pictures. When Tugwell became Under Secretary of Agriculture in 1935, he was put in charge of the Resettlement Administration, which Roosevelt established by executive order that same year. A pet project of Eleanor Roosevelt, resettlement took impoverished people out of their homes and into new communities, complete with new houses and businesses. The old communities were condemned and torched. Tugwell asked Roy to form a historical section to document resettlement with both written material and photographs. That's when Rothstein joined Stryker and helped him set up the photo lab. In his interview with the Smithsonian in 1964, Rothstein recalled his early days in Washington. Stryker benefited a great deal from having two people who were already in government and who were tremendously interested in photography and in Roy's work, Ben Sean and Walker Evans. Now, these men were a little farther advanced in the field. They already had reputations. Ben was a well-known artist at the time, and Walker Evans was an accomplished photographer with a very definite sense of style. Both of them contributed a great deal to my own development as a photographer in those days because they had very definite approaches, and it was not just a question of making a picture, but making a picture that had meaning. They made me very aware of the elements that go into photography, that go beyond just the content of the picture. The elements of style, of individual approach, of being able to see clearly, being able to visualize ideas. I'm quite sure these two people did more for my development as a photographer than any two photographers that I could think of at that particular stage. Of course, I would imagine that as I've gone along in my career, there have been many people who have influenced me. Certainly now, I'm involved in an entirely different kind of work, in photojournalism. They were not concerned at all with photojournalism. They were interested in photography as a fine art. Arthur Rothstein's career with the FSA can be told with two of his assignments. In my opinion, they reveal choices and temperament leading him away from art to photojournalism. His first assignment was to Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. It was awkward. Here was a city boy transplanted to a rural, impoverished countryside in Appalachia. The people of these hills were to be resettled, which meant taken from their homes and transplanted to new houses and communities at the edge of what would become a new national park. Rothstein recalled what happened next. Well, 
There were great advantages, of course, in being a provincial New Yorker, because everything seemed fresh and exciting. We had a group of people there that were being moved out to make way for a national park, Shenandoah National Park. And these were people who lived in the hills and hollows of the Blue Ridge Mountains, not far from Washington, about 80 miles. I went out there and I lived in a cabin on the top of a mountain for a few weeks, walked around, and became acquainted with these people. At the beginning, they were very shy about having pictures taken, but I would carry my camera along and make no attempt to take pictures. They just got to know me, and finally they didn't mind if I took a few pictures. I took quite a few unusual pictures at that time, using a Leica camera and a technique that is almost a standard now. A technique that I developed out of necessity, all by myself, which I call the unobtrusive camera. The idea of becoming so much a part of the environment that the people aren't even aware that pictures are being taken. I did it out of necessity. It was the only way I could get these pictures, you see. The purpose of the project was to photograph these people who were going to be moved out and photograph them in such a way that you had some idea of how they lived and what they did, because their entire way of life was going to be destroyed. They were going to be taken out of this environment and moved into shiny new houses where they would no longer have the picturesque quality that they had had living in the hills. This record I made, I think, served a very useful purpose. It showed how a certain group of people in the United States lived at a particular time and they no longer exist. I think that it has a great deal of value. Some of the pictures I made were good enough to be considered fairly fine examples of photography. But before I went out, I had long discussions with Roy Stryker about what I was going to do and what I was going to show. Roy was the one that made me aware of the fact that there is a great deal of significance in small details. He'd made me aware of the fact that it was important, say, to photograph the corner of a cabin showing an old shoe and a bag of flour, or it was important to get a close-up of a man's face, and it was important to show a window stuffed with rags. He made me conscious of all these things, and I just went out and did them. I enjoyed doing them, and in the process of doing them, I developed a certain sense of design and order and composition and combine that with the use of a miniature camera, which at the time was only six or seven years old. With the Shenandoah images, it's easy to see the influence of Evans and Sean in the attention to detail. At this point, he was faithfully following Stryker's assignment and trying hard to emulate Walker Evans and Ben Sean's style. In fact, Walker Evans made the unkind remark that Rothstein was just a rubber stamp. A year later, during his 1936 trip to Cimarron County, Oklahoma, the heart of the Dust Bowl, Rothstein would find his own style. Rothstein recalls his most famous photograph from Cimarron County. Well, of course there was still this one assignment that will always be one that I will remember. It was the one that resulted in my making the famous dust storm photograph a photograph that has probably been reproduced more than any other picture in the files. And it's a photograph that I'm very proud of, even at this date. And when you realize that I made this in 1936, 28 years ago, and it still holds up 28 years later, to me, it's an interesting commentary on the success of some photographs. This was an assignment given to me by Roy to go to the Dust Bowl, to Oklahoma, Kansas, to Texas, to those areas that were being devastated by drought that were suffering from wind erosion. You may remember the stories in those days about the black blizzards that swept across the plains and even darkened the sky in New York City. In the April 1944 edition of The Complete Photographer, Arthur Rothstein says this, the repetition of a scene before a different background with some changes in gesture or direction of movement will sometimes result in a more effective picture. The picture of a farmer and his sons in a dust storm 
was controlled in this way. The little boy was asked to drop back and hold his hand over his eyes. The farmer was asked to lean forward as he walked. Finally, the whole scene was made to take place in front of the shed. This showed the effect of the dust storm and the poverty as a farmer more clearly than the other buildings. So what are we to make of Rothstein's construction of the dust storm photo? Is it art or is it propaganda? One reaction is to be offended he deceived us. But isn't it posed just like hundreds of other FSA photographs? Dorothea Lange's migrant mother was posed. Posing people in their homes or in their barren fields was standard practice with all FSA photographers. Look at Marion Post Walcott photographing a family group in 1940. FSA photographs fall into three major categories. Simple documentation, for example, landscapes, community activities, farm animals, and equipment. Portraits of individuals or family groups, and architectural images. For example, Walker Evans' image of Floyd Burroughs' kitchen in Hale County, Alabama, or his chicken coop. Or Ben Sean's image of the Arkansas squatter's shack. Rothstein was simply following the style and mission of the other photographers in the FSA office. But some in Congress attacked Stryker's mission, dismissing it as a propaganda machine and saying his photos were a communist distortion of America. Grace Tugwell, wife and assistant to Rexford Tugwell, said in her interview with the Smithsonian in 1965, it was also clear to her Roy Stryker's FSA historical section was all about propaganda. Which is exactly what we were trying to do, was propaganda. This is what we were trying to do, tell the story, so that we would get more cooperation and help. The Oxford English Dictionary defines propaganda this way. The systematic dissemination of information, especially in a biased or misleading way, in order to promote a political cause or point of view. Because art produces strong emotion, it's always had a cozy relationship with propaganda. If a photograph moves you to question your point of view, it's often dismissed as propaganda. If you agree with the photograph's emotional message, it's probably art. Judgment of a photograph as art or propaganda is often made according to an individual's temperament and politics. So where does Arthur Rothstein fit in? He was clearly affected by Roy Stryker's social evangelism and propaganda mission. We had a great social responsibility. This is one thing we all had in common. We were dedicated to the idea that our lives could be improved, that man is the master of his environment, and that it's possible for us to live a better life, not only materially, but spiritually as well. We were all tremendously socially conscious. This was evident in everybody involved in this project from Roy right on through, even to the secretaries. As the youngest of the FSA photographers, Rothstein must have been very competitive. But Walker Evans and Ben Sean's artistic images were a tough act to follow. You can see the young man striving toward art in some of his best images. But deep down, I think he knew he was no artist. Like Stryker, he would see photography for how it could change society. The older man had brought him from Columbia and had taught him well. The kid from the Bronx was an excellent photographer who could push new ideas into the public arena, make them concrete and understandable to the masses. There was enough of the artist in him to make his pictures compelling, if not worthy of museums. After his work for the FSA, Arthur Rothstein would embrace photojournalism as a profession that would continually walk the line between art and propaganda. It's fitting Arthur Rothstein went on to become a working photojournalist for Look Magazine and later a university professor. His book, Photojournalism, 
went through four editions before his death in 1985. The introduction to the last edition concludes with these words. The modern photojournalist should not merely cover the news. He should make the news. The process of communication is so complex and expensive that to justify the cost and the effort, the photojournalist must have something important to say and know how to say it.